All right, so it's my uh, great pleasure to enthusiastically welcome Dr. John DeManja to our campus. Welcome. Uh, John comes to us uh, as a current branch director at the FDA, where he is in the tobacco branch, and he is essentially looking at regulating and developing methods for tobacco products and other things, I presume, in there too. Uh, let's see, he got his PhD way back. <clears throat> After that PhD, he worked at NASA for six years um, out in California and then the CDC. Um, and then in 2002, he spent uh, many years up until quite recently working at Spelman College. So he has a long history of service in the government and also doing um, awfully cool things on the scientific front and working with students. So he's currently not only at the FDA, but he maintains his position at Spelman College and also a joint position at Georgia Tech. And over the past 13 years, I thought I would uh, emphasize this particular point. He has um, mentored 86, 86 students over the past 13 years. And I think most of those are undergraduates, am I correct? Yes. Um, he's also a, a member of the Journal of Chromatography Board, and he runs uh, various conferences, co-chairs various conferences in the area of analytical separations. And without further ado, I'd like us to welcome John and hear his presentation. Thank you very much, Jane, for that wonderful introduction. I'm so happy to be here, and um, I want to take another moment to just really thank the uh, uh, students that I met at lunchtime. I think it was a very um, interesting uh, uh, back and forth and interesting talk that we had. So thank you again for your engagement and uh, for a wonderful lunch. So the uh, title of my talk is uh, Comprehensive Multidimensional Gas Chromatography for Targeted and Non-Targeted Analyses, Advances, and Perspectives. And beyond it being a mouthful, <laughs> it's, um, an int I hope, over the next, um, over the period of my talk, I'll be able to introduce you to um, the um, uh, excitement that we've had over the development of this technique that essentially transforms chromatograms. This is a chromatogram of petroleum that contains over 10,000 compounds. And, uh, it, it transforms these chromatograms that look like that into things that look like this. And so this is a multidimensional uh, chromatogram that was run under the exact same conditions as the chromatogram at the top. And what just happened there? All right, hopefully it doesn't do that periodically, but we'll see. And so, um, these con they were run at exactly the same conditions, and so you have a correspondence of the high compounds here that are saturated hydrocarbons that are found here at the bottom. And you see the correspondence, uh, so, so here the resolution of, uh, you probably can recognize about 120 to 200 peaks, and here at the bottom you have over, over 6,000, 7,000 peaks resolved. So you have a very big increase in the um, resolution uh, or the separation power of the technique. Um, but what has really excited uh, analysts more recently is the fact that these separations are structured. And uh, unfortunately, these are probably too dark, but um, what here at the bottom edge of the chromatogram, you have saturated hydro hydrocarbons. A little above that, in this sec segment, you have branch hydrocarbons, here you have monoaromatic compounds, and here you have two ring compounds, and you can see that a, a level of structure that we generally did not associate with chromatography before, because when you look at this chromatogram here on top, those, single, those uh, signals are all convoluted. And so in this presentation today, I'm going to try to um, you know, explain why we're doing multidimensional, how we do the multidimensional techniques, and then applications in a number of different areas. And so hopefully that will give you um, a general idea of where, we're, where I'm seeing it from the analytical chemistry perspective, even though I know a number of you, uh, through connections to uh, Professor Hill, are, are doing applications of this and are already familiar with, um, with the technique. So I teach at Spelman, or taught there until very recently, and this is how I tried to get my students. I tried to explain the importance of multidimensionality through the president's example. 
And as I told some folks uh, earlier today, my father is a history professor, so this was my attempt to also uh, let him know that uh, history and chemistry are connected. So this is what I call the president's example. And I have actually published this example in connection with software that we developed uh, to explain this. And so the premise of the example, this was done on election night 2008 when Obama was, you know, on election night when he was being elected. Um, I only added this picture after the election, so <laughs> no premeditated things there. But I considered as a chromatographer that this collection of presidents are like chemical compounds in the sense that they all have properties, height, weight, and so on and so forth, that define them, just like we do with chemicals. And so I invented a technique that I called namography. And in namography, what you do is you look at, if you have a mixture of names, you have a name separator, which looks like a chromatography column, and a detector, and it separates by the number of letters in the name. So example, we take Barack Obama. If you use a first name stationary phase, then it will key in on the fact that he has six letters in his first name. If you have a second name, uh, last name uh, stationary phase, then it will key in on the fact he has five letters. So here's a namogram of Barack Obama based on his last name, and you have a peak at five. Right? So nice way of transforming um, ideas that we all know and, 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 and can relate to, to a signal of chromatography. Turns out that demography can predict presidential elections. Here's a separation of the presidential candidates, Obama and Romney, and the fastest eluder wins the election. <laughs> so that's why Obama won. Of course, any theory needs additional data. Here's a 2008 election. That's why Obama won in 2008. Note that peak height is the height of the candidate. And here's proof that um, namography is not uh, associated with political affiliation. Here's the 2004 election and Bush v. Kerry. Yes, question. This is my example. <laughs> I'll put a caveat there at the, at, at the end, because there's always somebody like you in the audience. All right. So here's the 2004 election, and Bush won. Now, if we go to the 2000 election, we remember that one being contentious. Oh, I'm getting used to you. I'll, I'll, I'll switch you off. So in the 2000 election, here was the problem. We had a coelution. And this underscores an important point. Sample complexity is not related to the number of compounds. It's related to the properties that you are analyzing at that time. So even though these people are completely different, the separation mechanism that we're using is not able to distinguish between them. So how is this guy going to you know, justify the 2000 election in his model, right? Well. And it was a little bit of an arduous road. So what we did is, since we couldn't separate them by last name, we tried the first name. <laughs> they coeluded. Well, since the first name didn't work, then we tried the middle name. <laughs> so now we know why the 2000 election was so contentious. <laughs> These guys were really coeluding on, on, on every front. So now we're at take four. How was the 2000 election decided? Vice presidents. All right. Cheney was the vice presidential candidate of Bush and really won the race there. Now, here comes the caveat. So once I did this and it worked for these three iterations, I was like, no, it can't be. The shortest name doesn't always win. It just so happens that we are on a very hot streak. <laughs> But as it turns out, out of the 57 elections, the longest name has won 33 times, and the shortest name has won 24. So, you know, the balance is actually in favor of the longer name. So we'll see in 2016 if we get back on track. So. Right. But it still underscores the point that you can have problems with separations with only two compounds. Right? So here, if we look at our mixture of 44, 
Now we have seven peaks, or seven divided by 44 is about 16% coverage. And if we look at it from the uh, first name profile, we have six peaks, we have about 14, so 14, 15%. But now when we look at it from the two-dimensional profile, we now have 22 peaks separated, or 50% of the 44 presidents. So there's the power of multidimensional chromatography in a very, explained in a very simple way. What we can also see here is the structure of these separations. If we look at how many uh, columns are occupied here, you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, which were the seven peaks that were associated with one of the dimensions. And here, you have one, two, three, four, five, and six, right? And so the six and seven that we have from the uh, uh, dimensions that they came from are still consistently respected in in uh, this uh, multidimensional chromatogram. And we see the same sorts of things in multidimensional uh, gas chromatography. But 22 is not 44, and so I invented another technique called alphabetography. And in alphabetography, what you do is then you take a mixture of letters in a single name and you put them through the system. And so if we want to do Bar Barack Obama, it's basically a histogram of the letters in his name. Right? And so now if we want to separate those two pesky guys, Bush and Gore, you see that if you look at their alphabetograms, you can do a selective on channel L and detect Gore where you wouldn't detect Bush. And likewise, we can find something in Bush, um, and I don't, the H here, that's not in Gore. Right? So the combination of the two techniques is very important because you need both the separation from the chromato chromatography side, but you also need the selectivity from the mass spec side. Right? So with this simple example, I'm able to explain the importance of multidimensionality in general and how it can apply to multidimensional techniques. And hopefully uh, you see that. So in the end, when I apply this, you get 41 peaks, and the only ones that can't be separated are John Adams and his son, right, the second and the sixth president, George Bush and his son, and one person who will have a hard time being separated is Grover Cleveland, who was both the 22nd and 24th president. Right? I guess the only way to separate him is by how much he weighed during these time. <laughs> okay. So hopefully now we're convinced with the importance of uh, doing these multidimensional separations. And now we'll move on to the instrumentation. So the instrument has, on the GC side, a long first dimension column where we do conventional chromatography. And then we have a modulator here, which is a non-column injector into the second dimension, which I'm depicting here as much shorter than the first dimension. And that's one of the keys to multidimensional GC. We want this separation to occur much faster so that it can keep in time with the separation that's going on in the, in, in the primary column. And then we have what I call a modulation into the time of flight, which is even faster, right? So the first dimension separation is done on the order of minutes just like we do in regular chromatography. Um, most of our runs last about you know, a half hour, uh, 20 to 30 minutes long. Uh, the second dimension is on the order of seconds, between four and eight seconds is what, uh, uh, what we need for a full separation in the second dimension. And then the TOF MS is in milliseconds. We can do about uh, up to um, uh, currently 500 uh, scans, uh, full, full scans per second. Although I only use that once just to see if it can be done. Uh, most of the time I run between 100 and 200 uh, scans per second. And so here's the modulation, modulator operation real quick. So you have a modulator in between the two. He, this represents the effluent coming out of the first column. And in the sampling mode, uh, you have a trapping in that little uh, zone of the uh, uh, effluent. And then you re-inject that into the second dimension where they get separated on the basis of the different stationary phase that's used. You only need one detector because the effluent from the first dimension is being injected sequentially at the frequency of modulation. Right? So as we go through this sequence, we're generating chromatogram after chromatogram. And I think we have enough here to see that even though a sample is sampled more than once, so even though a compound may be sampled more than once, 
it's never going to catch up with itself because it's the same compound. So its retention in the second dimension is going to be the same. But what you can use it to your advantage is its confirmation that that compound is there. And so that is uh, uh, very nice. And so once you have uh, run the complete sample, and I'm, I'm stopping here just for the purposes of the uh, example, what you have is you can represent this in a 3D plot format or in a contour format that will show up here in a second, where the first dimension is in terms of the retention time, the elution time out of the first column. The second dimension is in terms of the modulation time out of the second, uh, on the second uh, column. And this uh, y-axis is the signal intensity. You can collapse those into a contour plot. These are visually pleasing, but these are more useful for quantitation and for um, <laughs> publication purposes, actually. So here's what the instrument looks like in the, in, in the oven, just a regular GC oven where you have the, the, the regular uh, column from the chromatography. Here's the modulator. Uh, in this instance, we have a modulator that's a thermal modulator. And then you have the oven for the second dimension, which is um, isolated from the first with insulation so that we can decouple the separation conditions of the first and the second dimension. There's another type of modulator that's called a valve modulator. And initially, even though those valves um, were not um, optimized for separation like the thermal modulators, they've come a long way. And so uh, at this point, uh, any 2DG syst uh, 2DGC system works uh, perfectly fine whether you uh, operate it with a valve uh, modulator or a thermal modulator. And uh, here's an example of uh, an earlier um, uh, incarnation of the valve modulation uh, done by Professor Seeley, in which he coupled uh, a GC column to two uh, GC columns on the back end. And in that way, he was producing three retention time values. And uh, the reason he was doing that was, first of all, to, com to uh, fight this uh, duty cycle problem he was having with valves, where he needed enough time for something to flush out of one line uh, before injecting in into the other. Uh, and then the second thing that he wanted was he wanted to use uh, a system of three different stationary phases so he could bypass mass spec. And his system was basically, if a compound has those three retention times, then it's confirmed to be that compound, and I, uh, I can bypass a mass spec. And so here's an example from um, uh, uh, one of the publications uh, where he, he did this. So you had the, the same uh, series of compounds that were separated on the two different systems. Uh, you probably cannot see uh, what's in black, uh, but the ketones which appear at the top here of that chromatogram appear in a different uh, region of the other chromatogram, which are there. And so you have those, again, that system of three different retention times um, uh, that locate a, a, a compound. Uh, of course, once that was published, the folks in the thermal uh, modulation uh, world wanted to show they can do the same thing. And so a couple years later, a gentleman by the name of uh, René Vreros from the Netherlands came up with what he calls a twin GCGC system, where he has two columns in the first dimension, a modulator, and then two columns in the second dimension, and he's producing a series of uh, chromatograms. So, and so here comes an interesting point. In the GCGC world, as far as column manufacturers, this is really the game, right? How many um, hyphenated techniques we can put in a row and the ones with the most uh, acronyms at the end of the day wins. Um, uh, I'm personally not into that game, but you know, it's good to, to know that there are different combinations that can be done. But again, the idea is that uh, a lot of research has been done in this area uh, to uh, justify the, uh, the interest. So now in terms of applications, um, I'm, the first application that I'm going to show you is one um, that involves tobacco work. Uh, now, um, because of the nature of um, the way we're funded at FDA, I cannot officially talk to you about any work that I do. But since I did tobacco work before I joined the FDA, I'm going to show you that. So this is a project that came to us from Brazil. And there were a number of compounds, uh, a number of cigarettes from Brazil, Paraguay, and uh, Chile 
uh, that were produced under uh, different conditions where they were uh, worried about the amount of pesticides. So they decided to smoke them and find out what levels of pesticides were in these products. We did not have a smoking machine at the time, so what we did is we rigged up this very sophisticated system with, you'll recognize a pipette, a manual pipette uh, device here. Uh, this was uh, fused in the glass shop with two um, sample vials that you know, we crimped. And on the other end here, we have a spimi fiber that was held with this high-tech uh, uh, box of, uh, <laughs> you know. And so you wedge in the cigarette at this end and light it up. Then you expose the spimi fiber and you lift the pipetter in order to create the flow going from this end into there. And your spimi fiber, which is right there, is uh, sampling your, um, you know, your effluent from, from, from the smoke. Okay? Now, this paper did not get published because we were not using standard operating procedures that are used. It, it turns out the tobacco industry has very regulated flows in, in cigarettes as to what the flow needs to be and the, 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 the burn time and all those things. So we thought we were clever by doing a little smoke experiment. So it's good for uh, show purposes, but um, the paper never got published. But I just thought it'd be nice to show you that. Um, uh, you, 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 can, you can get this done. So, but the bottom line is, even though we did not have regulated smoke um, uh, conditions, we were able to produce very different fingerprints for the uh, six different types of cigarettes that um, you know, we analyzed. Now, the problem with um, tobacco, or tobacco smoke, is that it is even more complex than uh, petroleum if you remember that first chromatogram of uh, petroleum that I showed you, it may have been complex in the number of compounds, but it was well stratified. You know, the differences between the saturated compounds and the monoaromatics, you had like a roof tile effect is, is what it's generally called. Here, it looks more like a spaghetti effect. You know, it looks like somebody just put these dots uh, in, a, in a scatter plot fashion. And so in order to find uh, specific compounds, uh, when you don't have standards, because the problem with, uh, with, with doing this high-resolution um, chromatography uh, separations is that you have a lot of compounds that are unknown, a lot of compounds that the confirmation needs to await the, uh, you know, the presence of a standard or a very high match on the mass spec. And so one of the things that is done is you can look at the total ion chromatogram and then extract one ion. And in this case, we use ion 162, which happens to be a prominent ion for nicotine. You see other dots there because these dots correspond to fragment ions from other compounds. Right? But the most prominent uh, compound there for uh, uh, mass 162 is nicotine. And um, this, once you locate it, you can uh, go to the software and match it um, individually with the library. And so we repeated this process for a couple compounds. So you see you have naphthalene there. But what we wanted to do is we wanted to see if we could recognize some of these families, some of these homologous families that, that, that are in there. So we did what is called uh, data scripting. And what data scripting is, is you look into the mass spectrum and you look at uh, different rules of uh, mass spectra. Uh, the the well-known McLafferty rules for, uh, for uh, mass spec. And these are things like the uh, M plus one ion is 10% uh, is, uh, of the M ion, for instance. Or you have a known loss of, of a methyl group. Uh, you know, things like that. And so here I'm just showing you, um, you know, an example of a, of a nice easy script that was written. And so uh, here's the TIC for uh, naphthalene with, in the circle here, and you have that in, indeed in the place where you have your <coughs> naphthalene compound. So what we did is uh, we were interested in the methyl ketones, so we wrote a script for those. And this was exciting because all the black dots, and I hope you can see at least some of them here at the end, all these black dots were in the same general area. And that meant that the probability of these compounds indeed being methyl ketones is fairly high. Right? And then what, what this does is it filters the data through all the peaks that you get, and then it locates the ones that respond to the script that you have given it. And we were very encouraged by the fact that they all fell in the same general area. 
We did this for another set of compounds. These are the aldehydes. And you got a different set of compounds. You have more of them. And again, I apologize for the fact that I put those in black, and they, I probably should have put them in, in a white color that you could see the dots better. But even though they're in, in the same general area, there's more of them and they're uh, populating the, um, the, the area. And so this, again, underscores the fact that uh, cigarette smoke is more complex because you have all these scripts that we're filtering out that are living in the same general area, and yet, using scripts, we can distinguish them to pull them out. So we were encouraged by that. And I'll show you where this is useful in, a, uh, in, in an example in a second, but I do want to add here that uh, one, of the, one of the things that this also uh, tells us is that we need to be, um, uh, you know, more uh, careful of the, the stationary phases that we pick for column selection in GCGC. And that's a discussion that I had with several of you uh, today. Uh, right now, for historical purposes, we're working with what the manufacturers are giving us, and we're working with what has worked for either petroleum or a bioanalytical sample. But how do we know that the combination of stationary phases that we're picking is the best one, or is at least one of the best ones? That question at this point is unanswered. We do not know. And we're just hoping that the power of the technique is going to separate things to our liking. But if it doesn't, now it's more of a you know, trial and error game where it really should be a quantitative process. And so uh, going forward, I think that's one of the areas where uh, we should put a little more work in. But we already have some, um, so, some, some good results, and I had some good talks with some folks about uh, what, what to do next. So here's an example um, uh, where scripting comes a little bit uh, in play. Uh, this is military fog oil. Military fog oil is used by the Army in, as an obscurant. So if you're deploying on a shore and you don't want the enemy to have a free shot at you, you get this uh, obscurant so that they don't know your movement. And so it's very effective uh, you know, in preventing uh, you know, enemy fire from, uh, from damaging uh, your equipment and your troops. But what does it do to the troops that are deploying? And so folks at the uh, Army Corps of Engineers um, contacted uh, us uh, a while back to find out what exactly was in uh, this obscurant. And here's the 1D chromatogram. So 1DGC is basically saying, are you kidding me? <laughs> you know? I mean, this, this is just a massive coelution of peaks that happens. Right? Here's the 2D chromatogram. It's also saying, are you kidding me? Right? But using scripts, what we are able to do is we're able to delineate certain regions of the chromatogram uh, and the compounds that live in them. Right? And the nice thing about scripting, the nice thing about scripting is um, you, can, you can confirm the compounds that are here living on the edge, and then if you have any dots that protrude into the more congested area, that tells you that we have, um, you know, we have those matches, or it's at least something to look at. Right? So even in the case of a compound that is overwhelming the dimensionality of even the multidimensional GC, we have some better information, some better answers, than if we went back to this 1D GC chromatogram where we are totally overwhelmed. Right? And so even in this case where we're not completely solving the problem, we are showing a, a better utility of, of multidimensional GC. Here's another example of trace PCBs in cow's milk. This trace, all this stuff here that you see, is the matrix. <coughs> and the green trace, you probably can see that little tiny compound and the little tiny compounds below it, that's actually the analytes of interest. Right? And so what's done here is um, when uh, this extract was prepared, uh, a few steps uh, were cut for th higher throughput, but what you're doing is you're introducing more of the matrix in the, uh, in the analysis, where, whereas if you uh, use those steps, you spend a lot more time, but, um, uh, but you extract them. And so here is that wall of matrix interference that you get, 
and then you get a little bit higher the compounds of interest. And so here's the use of multidimensional GC in a sample preparation um, mode where you're using it in order to separate the analytes of, your, uh, of interest from, from, from your matrix. And in this particular um, uh, project, what they did is they did the quantitation using uh, C13 labeled compounds. What happens is those C13 labels are coeluding with the native compounds, but that is not a problem from the time of flight um, uh, perspective because you can separate them and quantitate them accurately. And so here is a calibration curve uh, using those, uh, labeled, um, th those labeled compounds. So one of the um, uh, myths of uh, GCGC is that you can't quantitate, so you can't quantitate accurately, but this is a method that shows that you can indeed do that. That is not, that is not the problem. Um, and if you look at the quantitative results, when you compare that to high-res mass spec and MSMS, you can see that the GCGC traces compare very well. In fact, the fact that you are separating them from the uh, noise makes it that in all these cases that we show here, um, you, you get even a, higher, um, a, high, uh, a slightly higher amount than in the, uh, in the other cases. And then we get to an example that is probably near and dear to our heart to some of you in the audience, uh, characterization, characterization of, of VOCs in human breath. Uh, I collaborated with somebody um, on, on this project. And what you essentially do um, is uh, you, you culture these bacteria. And again, we use this uh, uh, solid phase microextraction technique to extract the volatiles. And you inject them and you get separations. Here's the, uh, from an analytical chemistry perspective, I want to show you what, what I liked about the project, is that there was a biomarker in Pseudonotus aeruginosa, I hope I'm saying it correctly, <laughs> close enough, right? Uh, to acetoaminophenone that uh, eludes right there in the 1D GC, so we compared 1D GC to 2D GC, so this is our 1D uh, GC results. And if you look at the mass spectrum, you get this mass spectrum, and here's the match from the library. And you can understand that because of the dissimilarity between these two, your match factor is not going to be as high as you want it to be. And that underscores the fact that that's a trace compound, and the trace compound here in this um, mass spectrum is probably mixed with either other compounds or with the matrix uh, or the noise from the column bleed. But when we look at the 2D GC of the same uh, comp, uh, uh, run, uh, the only difference is one was injected on 1D and one was injected on 2D, you see that this area of the chromatogram where acetyl, uh, two amino acetophenone uh, elutes is actually littered with a number of peaks. Now, these are all at the trace level, but it's enough to change that mass um, uh, spectrum uh, significantly. And now that it is separated from the rest of the coeluents, we have a very good match in the uh, spectrum and the library match. Right? So the separation power of the technique is really um, very helpful in this case. And this is uh, very good uh, for not only trace analysis, but it comes into play also when you're doing uh, discovery because it's much, uh, you're much more confident of the quality of your match by mass spec when you know that it's been properly separated from the other compounds or the matrix. Right? And so our most recent paper that came out in March is one where we looked a little more in, um, in uh, detail at the uh, instrumental parameters and the software parameters to um, uh, look at, evaluate the uh, mass spectral matches for these compounds. And both papers were both re uh, well received. Um, the bottom line is we are able to propose, uh, so in white here you have the number of compounds that were currently known, which were at 34, and what we did in the, that 2012 paper that I showed you a couple of uh, slides from is we were able to propose a number of new compounds uh, that um, we're fairly confident to add to the list of markers um, in these cultures, right? And uh, even though we're increasing this almost, uh, almost doubling it by a factor of two, uh, 
we were very conservative because we had over 400 candidates and we, reject, we tried to reject just about everything uh, using very stringent uh, parameters, uh, for example, for the similarity matching and uh, a, whole, a whole host of uh, factors, including uh, when these, uh, these things were run in um, multiple samples and if there were any shifts in retention times that, that were not consistent, then we eliminated the compounds as well, right? <coughs> And so I think this is going to be a very important area of GCGC uh, to, uh, to bring in new data because, again, like I, like I said earlier, um, targeted analysis works for the compounds that you expect, but untargeted analysis is working for the compounds that are new that you have no idea were in there in the first place. And so we need a way to um, uh, try to at least give an identity to these compounds before we match them with uh, standards, right? And if GCGC through the structure and the help with mass spec is able to give us that, then that's a good thing. This is some of the latest work that I've done that were inspired by some of the work that we've, uh, we, we did uh, with Jane. This is in conjunction with the uh, uh, mechanical engineering group at Georgia Tech. And what we did is we wanted to separate in a breath sample the alveolar breath, which is the breath that's in the lungs, from the dead space air breath, the breath that's um, in the rest of the pathway. Because we're thinking that when you're breathing into a Tedlar bag, that amount is diluted. So the, the little contraption that we devised here is one where this is the mouthpiece where you're breathing in. It goes into a cooled chamber, and this chamber is cooled with isopropyl alcohol at minus 20. So what happens is the uh, heavier compounds that, are wa that have water in them are trapped, and then the rest moves on to this second bath that is liquid nitrogen at minus 196, which traps the rest of the um, effluents. What we have added to this for the, uh, uh, the division of the alveolar and the um, dead space air breath is we've added an extra valve here that makes the difference between um, in a person's breathing when they're breathing the, the, the breath that, that is outside of the alveolar cavity to the breath that is inside. So at this point, we, uh, we are able to have an experiment where we collect things in the Tedlar bag and we collect things in the liquid syringe collect, uh, uh, collection. And then what we do is we do a spemi extraction of the volatiles directly out of the Tedlar bag. And for the liquid uh, part, we do a derivatization of the semi-volatiles, and we analyze that by GCGC as well. And then we send a portion of this liquid over to uh, Emory. This is a collaboration that we have with Emory Medical Hospital so that they can do an LCMSMS, which is targeted. The collaborator at Emory happens to be interested in fetal alcohol syndrome, so there are a number of uh, analytes that are of interest, and we just want to make sure that we provide that data. So that's targeted analysis. And in this case, we have non-targeted. This portion here has never been analyzed before. And so this data, we have no idea what to expect from that portion of the semi-volatiles that we are derivatizing uh, by trimethylsidylation. And then in this segment here, we have the SPEMI, where we have volatiles, some of which we expect and some of which are new. And so we have um, uh, three areas of interest from that collection. And so what we, what we have, uh, and I think this data is from a series of um, uh, peaks for the volatile fraction. We have uh, peak table filtering, and um, uh, Ted, who's in the audience, is probably looking at this and saying, that looks familiar, because we did a similar project um, with Jane on cheese that involves some peak filtering. And what we're essentially trying to do here is we're trying to find the matches between different um, runs um, uh, using um, retention time similarity, mass spectral similarity, and another, uh, another uh, number of other factors. The difficulty here, if you're doing this from a peak table, is that uh, because they're collected at different times, you may have some very uh, uh, little shifts from run to run and we're trying to correct for that. And so um, we independently, we had developed some peak filtering um, uh, macros with, uh, with Ted and Jane, and here we went ahead and developed uh, another, a different macro just to use a, a slightly different approach, and here I'm just showing you uh, 
um, you know, some elements of, of this macro, and I'm not even sure I'm showing you the results. No, I'm not showing you the results. But um, basically, uh, we're able to do some peak filtering here that allows you to um, uh, see what matches are in between samples. The importance of peak filtering is um, the fact that sometimes when you're doing exploratory work, you don't have time to run 30 runs that you need for statistical analysis. And so we need software that allows us to uh, work with our preliminary results um, and, and gives us the advantage to see whether it's worth pursuing. Then we can do the additional runs that we can then analyze with high-powered multivariate, uh, multivariate analysis techniques like PCA and, uh, and the like. Right? And so one last thing that I want to mention are some of the uh, developments in uh, GCGC for the future. One is MEMS technology. So there are folks in the um, uh, Michigan, uh, University of Michigan that have been pioneers in the development of MEMS, uh, MEMS technology. Uh, this work here is some, some work that we're also doing at Georgia Tech for this. And you can see that the etching of the channels is, um, is, is well done and the, um, the knowledge is, is definitely there. Uh, what we need is we need some additional um, uh, work on uh, scaling down the injection volumes so that they're not overloading these columns and the detectors so that they're, they're um, um, are compatible uh, with uh, the, the GC work. Uh, the vacuums uh, at the outlet of a MEMS system are different than the vacuums at the outlet of a, a conventional system. And so I only know of one group in France that has a uh, time of flight mass spec that, can, that is connectable to a MEMS. And they have not published the data. It, it was part of our proceedings. And so I am very interested in um, you know, talking to them to see if um, we can connect and, and get some more work done. But I, I believe that um, you know, the future of uh, these technologies will be tied into uh, MEMS technology because ultimately, uh, whether it's breath analysis or uh, farming where you're looking for volatiles in farms that are affecting crops, you want to have in the field units that are probably just twice the size of, of this phone where you can collect data and GPS it back uh, rather than ha to have uh, um, inline uh, uh, technology. So my hope is that um, in, in a few years, uh, not, probably not in the too distant future, we will have uh, you know, these units. So with that, I'll uh, conclude uh, that uh, GCGC, uh, hopefully I've shown that GCGC has uh, shown very good uh, instrument uh, development um, uh, so far. And with what I've just discussed, uh, we're, we're poised to uh, uh, develop some more in the future. I think that in terms of hardware, we understand uh, pretty much where we're going. In terms of software, there's uh, some uh, very good progress that's been made in the, in the past few years, but it could use a few more developments in order to take advantage particularly of the structural uh, capabilities of, of JCGC. In terms of application development, I showed a, a few applications in, uh, in some areas that hopefully uh, demonstrated the power of the technique. Um, uh, of course, based on your particular interest, um, it, it, you know, it may be at this time tied to a bioanalytical, but uh, you know, proof of concepts have been used in the environmental field, in the industrial field, in the food and flavor field, uh, and so on and so forth. So it's shown some very good versatility. And finally, method development in GCGC is where I think um, a lot of the work needs to be done. Uh, questions that I ask, such as how are you using the best columns? Normalization efforts. Um, uh, you know, one of the big powers of mass spec is that they have that NIST mass spec library of electron impact spectra. And we do not have a normalized retention uh, database for GCGC because I think that a lot of these compounds, these smaller molecules, are used in a lot of different uh, sample matrices just in different amounts. But if we had the, that database, then that would help us across the board. And I think that's an effort that, I, uh, you know, that, that a lot of people should um, try to get together and work on because I don't think that that database is impossible to generate. And, um, um, and the, the impact of having that database would really be helpful uh, to the field going forward. And so with that, um, I'm going to uh, conclude my presentation by thanking
a number of folks whose data I showed today, um, Dr. Jane Hill, Dr. Glenn Freisinger uh, was that petroleum sample that I showed at the beginning of the presentation, John Seeley for the GC Times 2G, 2GC work, Peter Hesketh uh, was the uh, uh, gentleman with the uh, miniaturized system um, and the uh, work for the breath analysis, uh, Renee Verles with the twin system uh, device, Zenita Car Cardill was the tobacco uh, smoke experiment, and Jack Cochran, who was tied to uh, Don Kropek from the U.S. Army of Engin Engineers for the fog oil. And NSF MRI, who, who allowed me to uh, purchase outright a GCGC system when I was at uh, Spelman College. And finally, um, you know, I put up a couple pictures here of, um, you know, progress through uh, science. So I started out in the Phillips lab as a fresh-faced uh, graduate student. And then over the years, I was able to graduate from, uh, from John Phillips. There he is looking on, looking on as I received my PhD. And now I'm trying to pass it on to the next generation of students here. Uh, and, um, you know, in academia, you may have uh, success through your patents and your uh, papers and your conferences. But in the end is who you're affecting that carries you through their work that's important. And uh, each one of these people, this is about 10 students of the over 80 that I've mentored over the years, and looking at each one of them, you, you probably can hear my voice cracking up. This, this, each one of them is a story, and uh, that's what carries us through. So I thank you again for your attention, and uh, I'll take any questions. Thank you. So there's a hardware solution and there's a software solution to that. Um, when you're using uh, mass spec, that is not a problem because uh, the mass spec, if the compound, the only caveat is the compounds have to be different enough in their mass spec signatures, then you can perform a deconvolution in the mass spec domain. So that is not a problem at all. The only, the only time you'll have a problem is if they are isomers in which case you need to have a column set that is actually going to physically separate them, right? Um, from the hardware side, there is a gentleman from Australia, Phil Marriott, who actually started a system where he had a smart valve at the end of the second column. So if you have a peak, a large peak and a smaller one, what he's doing is he's shunting out most of that large peak to put it in a situation where you only have a little bit or commensurate amounts of the trace analyte. So he's, he's essentially trying to reduce the amount of the, um, of the large peak. And that, that solution, I think, is going to be uh, important if you're, if you're using uh, instruments such as a flame ionization detector that doesn't give you the additional um, uh, separation dimension in the mass spec domain. Right? But the way I see these instruments evol evolving in the future is you will have um, uh, GCGC with mass spec for method development because you really want that correspondence between the separation and the um, an, uh, additional information that's given to you by, by the mass spec. But for routine analysis, once you've determined where your, your separation spots are and you know more about your, your technique, you can use a GCGC with a flame ionization. And the price tag between the two is uh, three orders of, well, it, not three orders of magnitude. It's, um, the, uh, you know, at least 60% less uh, for the FID. So it's, uh, it's worth um, targeting FID for routine analysis uh, and saving your, your mass spec for the, the harder problems at the beginning of the method development process. Yeah. Yes? Yes, there are several different uh, options that you can use, and we're actually thinking about that because Tedlar bags are actually very crappy. Uh, 
And I did not know this, well, I wasn't a health, you know, a health person, uh, but uh, as we were looking at the background from Tedlar Bags, horrendous. And when we started talking to people in, in, in that field, they're like, oh yeah, we know that, you know? So sorbent traps are, are, are something that uh, they would prefer using uh, rather than Tedlar bags. So there are, there, there are other solutions. But the nice part about our modular approach is uh, at the other end, we can, we can hook up what we want, right? Uh, the trapping in the liquid nitrogen is, is, is the key, you know, the key operation. And then when we, elute, when, 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 when we heat that up, whatever device we have that's the best is what, what, what we would use, yeah. But uh, yeah, I'd, I'd like to get away from Tedlar bags. I, you know, uh, don't like them. <laughs> yes. Um, with mass spectral data, one of the issues you often encounter is that um, you'll be given the option to choose between a variety of different compounds that are not structurally identical but which have similar mass spectral scores, and you're being asked to, amongst all of those choices, choose the one that's, I guess, most plausible given the analyte you're looking at. What is your general At the moment, it's just pure luck, just chance, just feel, right? But that's an area where we need a lot more work. But um, uh, hopefully, uh, we can devise some rules um, so that we can, we can become smarter at recognizing uh, what I'm starting to call chemical retention ships, right? So if you look at NMR, you can recognize the impact of a functional group by the, reten by the shift, the chemical shift, right? And if we look at these 2D GC chromatograms, we've done some experiments with, uh, I published this in 2004, with a mixture that I named in honor of my advisor, the Phillips mix, that's a mixture of homologous series. And what we noticed when we injected that is that there was a correspondence of, uh, by carbon number of you know, the, the different compounds that belong to uh, similar homologous series. And so in there, I think there's a message that the molecular world is as structured, um, you know, ha contains some very specific structure. And what I want to do is I want to study these chemical retention shifts. So if I have hexane and I shift by this angle in that direction, I want to know if I have one hexene. And if I shift in this direction, I want to know if I have one hexanol. And if we, be, if we start establishing those maps, right, just like an NMR, the retention shifts didn't create themselves in one day, but if we study these maps, then we will be able to recognize um, uh, functional groups on the basis of known standards that we have in a mixture. It seems like a pipe dream, and I've had very, very spirited discussions with some folks uh, that don't see uh, chromatography ever reaching that level. But the structure is so clear in these chromatograms that I know that we just need a good example or two to show that there are rules there that we can, um, um, you know, exploit. It may take, because things are so jumbled up, it may take us, uh, uh, you know, a set of different pictures, different uh, column sets in order to create. The, are you, any of you familiar with the technique of photogrammetry? It's a technique used in forensics where pictures are taken from different angles of a crime scene, and from those different pictures, you can reconstitute the, you know, uh, the, the true spatial, um, uh, you know, um, the true spatial locations of, of different objects. Because any any picture from any angle is going to be biased with respect to some things, right? And so, I'm thinking of a similar approach to uh, GCGC where if you have a twin GCGC mode, or if you have uh, three uh, column sets that you know are orthogonal or different enough from their angles, you can create these separations and then look at spatially where your compounds are. So uh, there's certainly some things that can be done or thought of in that, in that regard. Remember, everyone's using the same camera on the same technology. For different people, like to say, sample differently. So you have variables that Yes. That is true. That is true. But if you, right, 
So standardization is something that I'm also very interested in doing because if you standardize the retention plane in the first dimension and the second dimension, then you have a basis of comparing, you know, apples to apples in different, in different settings. So on that note,